everybody. Uh, just give me a moment to uh, get myself plugged in. Um, I hope the irony hasn't escaped you of doing a, uh, a talk on a very old-fashioned technique uh, during a session on uh, modern anesthetic practice. Um, just for a show of hands, could I ask um, who routinely does paramedian lumbar epidurals as their primary technique uh, in obstetric anesthesia? So I guess my goal today is to try and convince at least one of you that it <laughs> might be worth a try. All right, so um, I should start off in the custom way, customary way and say that I have nothing to disclose, um, apart from maybe a, a small snafu I had last year, uh, which was my first wet tap. Uh, I'm not showing off, it just really was. Um, it's a very humbling experience. So I'm going to talk about a technique which was first described by John Bonnaker, who was... Um, he started his professional career as a uh, wrestler. He was from Sicily, um, so not to be messed with. And he became one of the founding fathers of um, pain research and pain care and uh, founded the International Association of the Study of Pain in 1973. So I think you've already kind of uh, answered the next slide, but um, historically, the number of sightings of the Loch Ness Monster uh, in history so far is about 3,000. That's probably more than the number of paramedian epidurals done in obstetric anesthesia since 1956 when it was first described. Um, the, uh, this is kind of shown in, in various different postal surveys. This is one published in the UK in 2006 uh, of about 1,200 respondents, 96%, uh, which is uh, slightly less than this group, I guess, uh, use the midline approach for lumbar epidurals. And only 4% were using paramedian. And those were experienced consultants. Um, I just wonder whether when those experienced consultants reach their expiry date, whether there's going to be a cohort of anesthesiologists who are going to be able to teach this technique. Uh, interestingly enough, though, 27% of those who were doing midline epidurals for lumbar um, used um, uh, paramedian for th thoracic epidurals. And it's instructive to also look at what people do when they're having trouble with their primary technique. And I'm guessing if you look across to the other column, the, the paramedian epidurals are buried in there somewhere, even though not specified. And if you look at what they then do once they're having difficulty and what their backup technique is, uh, certainly for, for people who are not very experienced in less than five years, they don't really change. They may try something not really radical like intermittent um, um, pressure on the um, plunger rather than continuous pressure. But there's really not good evidence there that they, they're able to switch to a different technique, which I think um, certainly if you look at the 10 to 20, 10 to 20 year category, uh, people are, are, are probably doing more paramedians as their backup technique. Why is the, the midline approach so popular in obstetric anesthesia? Well, uh, most of us uh, teach the midline, and I, I very much feel like I'm the odd man out at, at, at Stanford. Um, it requires uh, less three-dimensional spatial awareness compared to the paramedium. The, uh, the ligamentum flavum is said at least to be widest in the midline. Um, if you look in Chestnut, it'll tell you that it's a, a faster technique, which I think is, is very much dependent on the difficulty of the patient and the experience of the operator. And it's also been reported as uh, the midline's less painful. Uh, certainly, if you look at this study, which was reported by COPAX in 96, um, uh, looking at the regional anesthesia learning curve, it was definitely uh, true that 
uh, in CA1 residents in their first six months of anesthesia practice, it was taking them slightly more goes uh, to get uh, an epidural in the paramedian approach compared to the midline approach. But I think that's only really relevant um, during the learning curve and um, certainly where I work and it's probably true in other places, they tend to have the more experienced residents working on obstetric uh, on the labor and delivery floor. So what's the relevant uh, anatomy that I can demonstrate to you? Well really, um, I suppose the paramedian technique is a shift uh, from the midline. Uh, the insertion point will be about uh, one and a half or one centimeter away from the midline. And in doing so, you begin to come in a little bit more medially as you angle the, the, mid, uh, the needle towards the midline. And there's also uh, a shift from starting at the middle of the interspinous space to a little bit lower so that ultimately the, the angle of the needle is uh, much more oblique compared to the midline approach which tends to be between 90 and 100 degrees. Now one of the ad theoretical advantages of this is that you're less confined by the uh, bony uh, tunnel that's created by the spinous process above and below where you're going. And you really have more uh, latitude uh, by not being confined. It's also worth mentioning that um, certainly as patients get older, they're more likely to get disease of the spinous ligaments if you're going through the midline, such as calcification um, or more fibrosis. So that can make uh, midline more challenging. Now if we examine the um, radiologically, the uh, target area, which was the interlaminar space, you can see quite clearly that in the midline, it's uh, the shortest distance vertically. And if you move more laterally, you have a slightly bigger target area. Well, what does this mean clinically? Well, one of the, one of the things about the midline approach is that it's much more dependent on the degree of flexion you can get from the patient. So um, if we're saying that it's um, less reliant on flexion and you have a greater anatomic tolerance, Maybe we'll be able to do epidurals in patients who can't flex for whatever reason. And it also, uh, by avoiding the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, um, at, at least in contradiction to some of the, um, the reports about it being more painful, you can actually uh, put more local anesthesia in the uh, paraspinal space than you can sometimes in the uh, the ligaments which uh, are less compliant than putting more local into the uh, surrounding muscle. Um, Podder reported a study in which patients had lower limb trauma and were having difficulty uh, flexing. So what they tried to do is look at uh, the, the success rate of trying to place a midline or paramedian epidural with the patient not flexing in the sitting position. And you can see particularly in the first column, that in the midline position, they had to adjust and switch to flexion much more commonly than in the, the paramedian uh, technique. Now, if we look at the ligamentum flavum, certainly in illustrations, it looks a little bit more chunky in the midline. And uh, you can pick your picture, uh, but that's even more exaggerated. Um, what does the anatomy look like um, in real terms, though? So, one technique is uh, micro, uh, sorry, cryomicrotome sorry, section, where you freeze the cadaver within 15 hours of death, uh, preserve the shape of the anatomy that's not distorted by further dissection, take the lumbar uh, epidural section out, and then slice it and look at the uh, imaging. And, and that reveals there's distinct left and right parts of the flavum, which is not always fused in the midline. And we certainly know that from examination of the uh, cervical and high thoracic segments, where you can sometimes see holes or clefts or a complete sulcus, uh, where the flavum hasn't fully grown in and joined in the midline. Certainly in this, um, in this, uh, uh, I think it's electron micrograph or, or maybe just an, an MRI. Uh, the, the white line signifies the approach in the midline. It's going through the spinous process. If you can see the numbers on the slide, uh, four is the lamina, uh, five is the ligamentum flavum, six is the epidural space, uh, 
um, and eight is in the intrathecal space. And it lo certainly looks to me like the ligamentum flavum is indeed thinner in the midline rather than in the lateral aspect. Now, it's sometimes reported, uh, certainly by Cook, for instance, that CSEs done in the paramedian approach have a slightly higher incidence of uh, spinal component failure. And one can see this how, how it might be so, that if you look at the, the red line, which is the, the projection of the needle in the paramedian approach, that's going straight into uh, the, towards the midline and should pierce the dura. But if uh, you have uh, less experience, it's possible that that would also get you into the epidural space, but then when you pass the spinal needle uh, through the TUI needle, you may miss the dura. So certainly uh, uh, one can theorize that that might be the case, but I think, again, that's operator dependent. Um, is it more painful? Well, it does take a, long, a slightly longer passage through the tissues, and so more inflammation, more trauma, potentially more pain. And um, certainly in the technique I'll demonstrate, you do intend um, to hit the, the uh, periosteum of the lamina to get your depth gauge. So there's another reason why it might be more painful. Uh, Anita Holcroft in um, the UK looked at this. She randomized patients to either approach. And she did assessments by visual analog score the next day and day after. And also some of the patients got an MRI to look for uh, some degree of tissue injury. And there was no difference between the groups. And I would just uh, consider that um, uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing a midline versus a paramedian, I find it much easier to put more local in the paramedian approach than uh, sometimes in the midline, where you can have quite non-compliant ligaments in the um, supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. So um, in terms of how you go about doing the technique, um, the, the patient's head would be on your left and the patient's uh, cordad region would be on your right. And um, my point of insertion is not that birthmark, but I've just made a little mark there where I would go. So I look for about one centimeter, one and a half centimeters lateral to the um, upper part of the spinous process below the space I'm aiming for. Um, the needle uh, in the uh, midline approach is just limited by that bony channel, which is, a, as I've said, dependent on degree of flexion. Um, whereas in the paramedian approach, and you can tell that I use this, uh, this spine a lot because it's full of little marks where I teach people the technique, you're aiming to hit straight on the lamina. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that the, the cordate insertion of the ligament of flavum is along this ridge. So you find your depth instantly at that point and then switch direction so that the needle comes to rest in that kind of position. But what you're really doing is just in short steps walking off the lamina until you get to that sense that you're in flavum and then you uh, convert to a, your loss of resistance technique, whichever you prefer. So just to kind of show you how the needle changes direction, You have to withdraw slightly as you're doing it because otherwise you're going to get uh, stuck by the elasticity of the muscle that you're going through. Is it possible to get the lights down? Um, so at the risk of exposing myself to um, a whole bunch of obstetric anesthesiologists and showing you actually me doing an epidural, um, this is courtesy of GoPro. The black square, in case you're wondering, is um, so you can't identify the patient's husband who was staring at me like a hawk. So <laughs> I'd very much recommend a poker face in future when you're doing an epidural, because I hadn't really noticed that before I started edi editing the video. So I really just try and mimic the anticipated track that I'm going to pass the TUI needle through when I'm putting the local in. Um, I do most of my epidurals in the lateral position, just in case it's not obvious, um, and that's a, a different lecture. So I'm moving and walking off the lamina in the small steps, and 
I feel like I'm in Flavum at that point, and I'll switch to um, the loss of resistance syringe. I guess we all hold the syringe differently. Uh, this was going to be a CSE, as you'll see the, the spinal needle goes in next. So I was minimizing the amount of saline I was putting in the space. This is the first time I've used a GoPro. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend it to teach, actually. It seems to make a reasonably quali quality video. And um, one of the things I'll, I'll mention uh, in a short while is the ease with which the catheter threads, usually in the absence of any paresthesia. So you can put the lights on now. You can see that the needle enters uh, and it's an oblique angle. And is there any uh, advantage in this? Well, some people report uh, a reduction in postural puncture headache. That's certainly true in literature looking at uh, spinals conducted through a paramedian approach. And th the reason uh, being is that if you make an oblique tract through a thickish membrane, then the force of the fluid coming out will press on uh, the two halves of the cleaved uh, membrane and press on each other, forming a kind of a valve effect. The other thing is that you have uh, a slight difference or offset between the point at which it goes through the dura and the point at which it comes out the other side on the arachnoid surface. So there's no easy direct tract for the uh, fluid to travel through. Um, and uh, certainly proposed is a reduction in wet tap when you're doing an epidural in, with this approach, and I'll, I'll explain the details of that in the next couple of slides. And certainly there's an ease of threading the catheter. Um, you can essentially with the needle travel through the epidural space further because you're going at an angle. Um, the ready looked at uh, the degree to which a piece of cadaveric dura which was attached to a fluid column was leaking with uh, different sized needles under different circumstances of insertion of degrees. So you have 22 gauge larger quinky point needles moving through to Whittaker needles, and these are all done at 90 degrees until you go to 60 degrees and 30 degrees. And you can see the rate of leakage with the, amount, the same amount of pressure through this um, in vitro uh, dura membrane uh, was much less when the, um, the degree um, through which you pass the needle was uh, more oblique. I mentioned the valve effect and the offsetting of the holes. So uh, Blomberg um, conducted an, another study. This is a, a cadaver, I should say. It's not one of our Stanford patients. Um, this fluid, uh, fluid is going to an uh, intrathecal catheter to mimic the normal CSF pressure, which is normally lower in cadavers. And then he put an epiduroscope in a, a higher level so we could then watch what happened to needles and catheters that were introduced either in the midline or paramedian uh, approach. And uh, I think it's not surprising that the av these are average numbers. The skin to loss of resistance in millimeters was greater in the midline compared to the paramedian. This is a, a number that I think is quite interesting, though, the 3.9 versus 7.6. So this was the distance between the first loss of resistance and the contact of the tip of the TUI needle with the dura. And you see you can um, travel through the epidural space further uh, with the paramedian approach because you're going through it obliquely. And that's been mapped uh, mathematically. Um, then they said, well, what's the likelihood of dural perforation if I advance the needle once it's touching? And they felt um, they didn't go through and uh, do this because they were worried about bleeding and not being able to see anything. Um, but in the midline, it, because it's aiming at the dura virtually at 90 degrees, it almost always looked like it was just about to perforate the dura, whereas in the paramedian approach, it didn't. Um, 
When you pass the catheter, there was a tenting because the catheter is again coming in at 90 degrees in most cases, but in none of the paramedian approach. And what happened to the catheter when you continue to thread it? Well, in the midline, uh, sometimes it went up towards the head, but often it didn't or it deviated laterally or even went cordat. In the paramedian approach, it always went straight and upwards. And I think part of the reason can be explained by this diagram. First of all, um, it's going to, when you do in the midline, it's going to hit at 90 degrees and then veer off a rebound at a variable angle. Uh, with the needle more parallel, the catheter has a better chance of going parallel with the space it's entering. You could also point out that the pointy part of the needle is right there, pressing against the dura. Whereas the reason why they felt it wasn't about to pierce the dura once it was touching was because you were opposing the more blunted surface of the needle against the dura as you advanced. Uh, this has been um, mathematically modeled in a very complicated slide, but I'll just tell you the, the juicy bits. Uh, this is the angle that the needle makes with the skin. This is the pushing pressure towards the dura. The pressure is proportionate to the sign of that angle. The degree to which the epidural needle can travel through that space is inversely proportional to that angle. So the smaller the angle, the more it can travel. Um, this has been uh, replicated in other studies. Here's just one example by Barreto. Uh, the use of the TUI needle in a paramedian approach for peridural block all catheters were placed uh, via a paramedian. All catheters were seen on x-ray to go uh, towards the, the head. Um, eight had a slight light, light lateral deviation. If you look at a study where uh, patients had epidurals placed either by paramedian or midline, depending on the preference of the anesthesiologist, and then you looked at what happened to them when they were threaded. Uh, the reason why this looks like crazy town is because a number of different catheters or uh, images are superimposed on each other's. These are lumbar epidurals, and what you can see is that some of them do go in a cephala direction, but a lot of them don't. In the uh, thoracic region, I think you could say that a higher proportion go towards the head compared to um, the previous slide. And I think the reason for that is in the thoracic region, the anesthesiologists were more likely to place the epidural by the paramedian approach than by the lumbar approach. Such that of the 151 patients examined, the chance of the catheter going three spaces towards the head was reasonable, but for the lumbar region, terrible. Um, is this relevant clinically? Well, uh, a, a, a French study published in the Belgian journal showed a five-fold uh, incidence of intravascular catheters with the midline approach. They theorized that if the catheters were going lateral, they'd be more likely to go towards blood vessels. Uh, that hasn't been uh, reported in other studies, and I would probably suggest to you that uh, now that we're using soft spring-wound catheters, that's more unlikely to occur, and you're even more unlikely to show a difference. And uh, there was a, a higher incidence of paresthesia. And we can only assume that paresthesia is a surrogate for the needle moving laterally towards the nerve roots. Or the catheter moving towards the nerve roots. Um, Blomberg again uh, looked at um, the same kind of things that he looked at before clinically in an older population of patients where you might anticipate the difference between the midline and the paramedian was greater given that patients tend to get more disease in the midline in the ligaments as they get older. And um, found uh, slightly more difficult insertion compared to uh, the paramedian approach and also interestingly had a slightly higher incidence of equivocal loss of resistance. The kind of loss of resistance that you sometimes get where you think, oh, that feels a bit squishy, I'm not sure, maybe I'll put a do a lumbar uh, puncture epidural uh, just to confirm the placement or I'll thread the catheter and see if it gives my patient any analgesia. And that may be going back to those cases where uh, there's a lack of fusion in the midline of the um, ligamentum flavum. Uh, 
Uh, finally, I think Brendan covered this mostly. Um, if you're um, a fan or a user of ultrasound, um, Grau looked at what's the optimal view that I'm going to get um, when I do the ultrasound. And I think Brendan mentioned parasagittal, they call it paramedian, but certainly the window here is much uh, easier with less shadowing uh, from the bony structures around when you look slightly to the right or left of the midline. And um, he graded um, uh, the visibility as low when it was very good and high when it was insufficient, and also the ratio of the shadow to the window. So a higher number here implies that the, um, the window was greater than the shadow, and for the previous uh, views that you might try in the midline, there was um, higher numbers suggesting this was uh, more difficult to discriminate the anatomy, uh, but in the longitude paramedian section, more easy. Finally, I just want to mention um, the patients with scoliosis. So this is um, superimposing a patient um, with that degree of scoliosis, and we'll focus on the angle of approach. Um, one might anticipate that the direction of the needle would have to be um, off the midline. Uh, this is the plane of the patient's back, so you'd be coming in at an angle. Um, Young has Huang has proposed that um, you could do things more easily if you went perpendicular to the plane of the back and you'd still be carrying out what would be otherwise considered a normal paramedian insertion. So, in summary, there's an anatomical advantage. Uh, there's less flexion required. Um, it gives you an instant get depth gauge. Uh, it's a backup technique for difficult uh, blocks. Uh, you can choose to do as your primary or your, your backup technique. Um, it's also easy to translate to thoracic epidurals, especially for trainees who don't get as, a, as much experience in trying those. Um, there's the potential for less wet tap, even though that's a, uh, a rare event that's hard to show. And there's um, an easy threading of the catheter with less paresthesia. And the catheter is more likely to stay um, cephalad in the midline. And um, as I say, you can transition to thoracic epidurals. So please do it. Thank you.